Thank you, Andy, for those kind words. I appreciate them. I thank the elders at Hillview for the opportunity to be here and the director of the lectureship and all of those who on the lectureship committee had a part in asking me to participate in this lectureship. I appreciate the opportunity to work with the School of Preaching here, which I have done for, I believe, 13 years, if I remember correctly. And I appreciate the opportunity because it gives me a chance to do what I came down the valley from Pittsburgh to do many years ago, and that is to try to help develop some preachers that could preach in areas not only around here but further north where where churches are scarce and preachers are equally scarce or probably even scarcer, if I may use that term. <clears throat> this topic today has become more controversial in recent years, I think, although I don't know how long there has been controversy about it. <clears throat> I remember when I was a boy, uh, once in a while, we didn't have a radio at home, but once in a while I'd be somewhere where there was a radio, and often they had on it a preacher. It wasn't Catherine Kuhlman, but it was some woman evangelist who would always be yelling. At, it seems like every time that I heard it, uh, she was urging people to keep on keeping on, you know, and that sort of thing. Well, I guess it's a good thing for Christians to keep on keeping on, but I didn't really appreciate the tone of her uh, of her speech even then, and I wasn't a Christian in, in those days. As I look at this topic today, I have to appeal to you for sympathy. Because, uh, for example, Carl Holliday says concerning verses 2 to 16, which is my topic today, and I quote, the meaning of these verses appears to be hopelessly unclear in spite of many ingenious but ill-fated attempts to explain them. <laughs> if it's hopelessly unclear, then I don't know what I'm supposed to do with them. <laughs> but Albert Barnes says concerning verse 10 that he doesn't know what it means. Howard Winters offers an explanation, but he says if that's not it, then I don't know what it means. I'm like Barnes, I don't know what it means. Well, let's look at the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 2. Let me read a few verses here. Paul, Paul said, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Traditions here has to mean the oral word that Paul preached before it was written down. Tradition is oral material that has been handed down. And this happened to be inspired oral material. Not all traditions are. But he says, verse 3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it's shameful for a, man to be, uh, for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. A man ought not to cover his head, since he's in the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, let's stop for a moment there and go back and look at some of these things. Let's see. Are they on the... Are they on the screen yet, or do I have to punch something to get them? Ah, yes, now. Now we begin to have some things there. <coughs> gender relations. I'm going to say that gender relations, uh, as I understand them here in 1 Corinthians 11, have to do with two things particularly. Thank you, sir. Yeah, leave, leave a little bit on so I can see what I'm doing here. <laughs> see what I'm reading when I read. Gender relations have to do with authority and appearance. Now, I have known a number of women who have felt like 
they knew more than most men and they had more ability than most men. In fact, I talked with a woman in, well, I won't say where. I don't want to, I don't, for, <coughs> in other words, names and places will be omitted in order to protect the guilty. <laughs> uh, but, but this woman said, I can preach better than any man in this town. And if they don't let me preach within the next two years, I'm going to leave this church and go somewhere where they will let me preach. Well, she did leave that church, but I don't think the place where she went let her preach either. Um, Catherine Kuhlman was a preacher when I was in preaching in Pittsburgh, and she had healing services, and she preached... She preached every week. And then there was a tent. Well, it wasn't a tent. After a while, it was they rented the old streetcar barn when they shut down the streetcars, and they had Brother Dan and Sister Ann down there, and, and they both preached. And they bust people in and got the whole streetcar barn full of people. And Catherine Kuhlman had a lot of people come to her healing services, too. Well, in recent years... Women's Lib has pushed the idea of women preaching. Now, if it wasn't, I'll tell you this, which is the truth. If it wasn't for the fact uh, that this passage and other passages in the New Testament plainly say that women are not supposed to be preaching uh, in public assemblies to men, my wife would be better off here than me because she is a pretty much... Uh, pretty much solid and expert on this topic of women's lib and so forth. But she wouldn't do that because she believes strongly that women have a place, but the place is not in the pulpit in the public worship assembly. Now, <clears throat> in verses 1 and 2, Paul wants them to remember him and keep the traditions. But in verse 3, he makes a statement that is really the crux of the matter. He says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. All right? So we're dealing here with an authority, uh, a hierarchy of authority. God is on the top, and then Christ, and then man and then woman. Whose idea is that anyway? That's God's idea. It's not my idea. It's God's idea. And this is his order of how he wants things. Now, a friend of mine said he had a good explanation for how this works. Because he says if a woman prays to God with her head uh, uncovered, she dishonors her head. And so he took, he took a, no, that's not what I want to do. Sorry about that. Okay. He took a piece of paper and he put it over man. He said, woman has to pray to God through Christ, eliminating the man. Cover up the man here with her head covered, her head's man. But a man, when he prays, he doesn't dare cover his head because he has to pray to God through Christ. Okay? That sounds, that sounds real neat, doesn't it? The only thing is, it avoids the real issue here. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about an order of authority. And he's talking about a covering that the woman has on her head. Now, I don't know... It seems natural for men to get bald-headed. Um, it doesn't seem natural for women to get bald-headed. Does it? I don't know many bald-headed women. And those that I have seen that are coming close to that are so ashamed of it that they wear wigs. And of course, I know a few men that wear wigs too. But, but the point is, Paul is going to talk here about how 
nature makes it so that a woman has more hair than men. That's God's order of things. That's the way he planned it. Now, we're talking about head. And there are people, of course, who don't believe this. One of them is Gordon Fee, who has written a commentary, and a lot of people quote him. And he believes that women ought to be preaching. He believes in women preachers. And therefore, he has to do something else with this passage. What he does with 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35, is he just throws it out. Talk about that in a little bit. He just, he just removes it from the Bible. If it doesn't agree with him, he throws it out. There are people who do that with other things, too. I heard about one woman who took a pair of scissors and cut Mark 16, 16 out of her, out of her Bible because she didn't believe that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So she said, that's not in my Bible. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't because she cut it out. That's why. Well, now when you look at this, you see head. Head is going to be used in a couple of ways here. Head sometimes is literal and sometimes metaphorical. Fee and others like him say that head here, and all the way through this passage, all the way through chapter 11, that head means source. Like the head waters of a river, the source of the river. But that can't work here. Among other things, he says in this very passage in verse 3, he says, the head of Christ is God. You mean God is the source of Christ? That's not what I read in my scriptures. I read in the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, or the Greek says God was the Word. Jesus is God, not the Father. He's the Son, but he's God. He didn't have his source from God. He and the Father and the Holy Spirit were all there at the beginning. Beginning of whatever. <laughs> Before the beginning of the world, they're eternal. And God is not the source of Christ. But what he's saying here is God is the head of Christ. What Fee is wanting to say is that God is the source of Christ and Christ is the source of man. Well, that would work because Jesus, John says in chapter 1, had a part in making everything that was made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So, so that would work. Uh, and man is the source of woman. Well, he was the source of Eve. But he's going to go on to say here in just a moment uh, that as a matter of fact, Men and women are mutually interdependent on each other. That men come from woman, and woman originally came from man. And so they're mutually independent. I think he said that so that men wouldn't get too proud of this matter that they do have authority. But when you talk about literal or metaphorical, uh, Thielman in the EV ESV study Bible says this, in over 50 examples of the expression, person A is the head of person or persons B, it was found <coughs> that person A has authority over person B, was the actual meaning of it in the Greek literature. Therefore, he says it's best to understand head here as referring metaphorically to authority. Regarding the word, the Greek word here, uh, which is translated head. Uh, Kaufman has considerable amount to say. We'll talk about that in a moment. Dave Miller says head clearly refers not to source, but to authority. Therefore, God intends for women to be subordinate to men in worship. Leon Moore says the head indicates a relationship of superior authority. We're talking about authority here, and Miller goes on to say that the reason he thinks the reason that women at Corinth seemed to be taking their covering off, whatever it was, 
in the public worship was because they wanted to speak in the public worship. And they understood that the veil or covering or whatever it was was uh, a sign of authority so that if they had that on, they couldn't take a place of authority and lead in worship. And that may very well be, that may very well be the situation. The meaning of head in verses four and five, look at those again. He says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. I think the meaning of this has to be, the meaning of this has to be that every man praying or prophesying, having his head, that is his skull, cranium, covered, dishonors his head, but he's not talking about his own dome, he's talking about Christ. He dishonors Christ if he prays with his head covered. Why would that be? Well, because we're dealing with custom here and what custom suggests. Custom suggested to those people, I believe it still suggests pretty much the same thing today, that a man in public worship ought not to be wearing his cap or his hat, a cowboy hat or whatever. Uh, that seems to have been a pretty universal custom. Although it is true, I guess, that Jews uh, in synagogues go and they put a beanie on and so forth. But I don't know that that was the case in these days. And besides that, Paul's talking about Corinth. He's not talking about Jerusalem anyway in this, in this context here. Though it may have been true also in Jerusalem. I don't know what their custom was. But every man praying or prophesying, having his skull covered, dishonors Christ. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head, her skull uncovered, dishonors her head, that is her husband, or the English Standard Version translates it uh, husband, or, or, her, or man, man her, her man or man in general. I think uh, the Greek does not make a distinction between man and husband. But he says that is one and the same thing as if her skull were shaved, and they shaved prostitutes. So it was a shame for a woman to be shaved or to have her head shorn, her hair cut real short like a man's. All right? I think we can understand that. I think that's what it has to mean. There are those who do not agree with this. Um, as I said, for example, Kaufman is one of those. Kaufman um, is, is one and there are a few others, but only a few, who say that hair is the only covering here. And one of them says that what this means is that when a woman prays or prophesies in church or if in an assembly with men, she has to have long hair which she can pull down and cover her face with her hair. I really don't think that's what's involved. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that that's the meaning that we're talking about here. And I'm not sure what the covering is. That is, I'm not sure what the nature of this covering is. Let me read to you uh, a little bit here about what one woman who was over in Iraq for two years uh, as a cultural anthropologist with her husband, who was a cultural anthropologist, Elizabeth Weldon Warnock Fernia. Uh, her maiden name was Warnock, and she married a man by the name of Fernia. They were, in a book, Guests of the Sheik. They were guests of a sheik uh, in Iraq. And she said, uh, I, I, won't, I won't read all of this, but what she said was that when her husband wrote to her and said he went over before she did, he was there for a few months in order to get things all set up and ready, uh, when she was ready to go, he wrote her and he said, and he sent her a package. <clears throat> and this package had a black garment in it, a sort of a, a, a sort of a real, real dark gray or black. And it's called an abaya. I think some women in some Arabic countries call it a burqa. Uh, but at any rate, 
this, he said, this is an abaya, and when you, when you get off of the plane, you need to be wearing this. And when you go out in public, you need to be wearing this. She didn't wear it. Well, he met her at the airport, and so nothing happened. Took her home. She looked over the place, and she said, well, there's a lot of stuff that has to be here. <coughs> Bachelors don't know how to furnish a house properly, so I'm going to have to go get some things. He said, you better put your abaya on. She said, no, I don't want to wear that ugly thing. So she took off, and she came back in just a few minutes, and she was fuming angry. He said, what's wrong? <laughs> Well, she explained that she had been propositioned several times. He said, I told you, wear your abaya. If you don't wear that in this culture, he said, you're advertising yourself as available for sexual services. Now, if that were the case in, your, in, in, in Corinth, and I don't know, but if that was the case in Corinth, then I understand perfectly why the woman should wear a covering, not only in public worship, but in public in general. But it's certain that there was a custom in Corinth that a woman who was in worship and did not have on a covering, and a covering, there are two coverings talked about here. Nearly all of your commentaries and your scholars are in agreement with this. As I said, Kaufman is an exception, and there are a couple of other exceptions, but nearly all of them say, you're really talking about some kind of a garment, some kind of a covering. It's, it's called, uh, in the lexicons, uh, you can look at Arndt and Gingrich uh, and other Greek lexicons, and it is called a shawl or a cape or some kind of covering that can cover the head and sometimes the whole body. Well, you see women wearing this thing that covers everything except their eyes and a little bit of their nose. Everything else is covered. In Arabic countries today, that's the situation. And sometimes in this country, just about as much of that as, as well. Um, the situation simply is that when the custom suggests that you are not a Christian, that you are not a good person, that, that you are immoral. If, as a woman, you don't wear whatever covering this is, then you had better wear the covering. I have a number of friends who believe that they have to, women, ladies, fine Christian women, who believe that they have to wear some sort of hat in worship. Well, if we had a custom that said, if you don't wear that, you are immoral, then I think she must wear it. Now, it's fine for women to wear hats. It's acceptable. There used to be a lot more of it than there is today. Still, it's not required in 1 Corinthians 11. I don't believe this passage is talking about that. This passage is talking about a custom that existed and that they needed to follow. Now we understand when we talk about head here, we understand this pretty well, but when it gets to Christ and God, people say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Christ is equal with God. Christ is not subordinate to God. Well, it is true that Christ is deity, just as God is deity. Christ is as much deity as God is. God and Christ are equal in deity, in essence. That's what uh, the, the theologians like to, that term that they like to use, they say it's the essence. Okay, so it's the divine essence. And also the divine attributes. But they have different roles. Jesus came to earth, sent to earth, conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary, sent to earth to die on the cross. God did not die on the cross. God cannot die. And so Jesus had to become 
a man, a human, in order to die on the cross for our sins. And that was his role. It's obvious when in the Garden of Gethsemane he says, Father, remove this cup from me if it is possible, but, but if not, your will be done. Nevertheless, your will be done. It was God's will that Jesus die on the cross. God was in that role superior to Christ. And when Paul said, and somebody said, well, that was just while he was on earth. Well, wait a minute. Paul is writing this Corinthian letter quite a few years after Jesus went back to heaven. And in writing it, he said, the head of Christ is God. Okay? So we have to understand he's not talking about the essence, the divinity, or anything of that kind. He's talking about Christ's role. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 5.8. And having become perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. The same thing is said in Philippians 2, where he emptied himself and was made in fashion of a man. And being in found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the death of the cross. That was Jesus' role. And it was a role that was subservient to God, to the Father. It was not that he was not as good as the Father or inferior to the Father or anything of that kind in essence. It was that in his role he was. Now, what we're dealing with here is appearance, an appearance that has a role in demonstrating one's submission to authority. Appearance was correct, connected with morality. Female prostitutes were shaved. Uh, culture held that appearance showed one's attitude toward authority. I think in some ways it still does. I know that sometimes young people rebel and insist that they should be allowed to, um, boys at least, wear their hats in worship, their caps, though they put them on backwards and all that sort of thing, but still, that's a sign of their rebellion. I think most people would say that for men, uncovered heads is what is called for. And in those days, uncovered heads and even including short hair. And for women, the covering both of her hair and of her veil or shawl or whatever that was. Christians dress and ha hairstyle, and this is the whole point. Christians de uh, dress and hairstyle should show to the public that they are an example of the kind of living and the kind of standards that Christ requires. What men and women wear in worship as well as how they act and what they wear also in other occasions should be such as honor Christ and not cause people to say, I wouldn't want to be one of those because those, those people are immoral or those people are not decent and so forth. That's something that we don't want to do. Now, there's a statement here that gives some problems. I get it? Yeah. No, I didn't either. I didn't get... I'm lost. Where am I? The head of Christ. All right. <coughs> We're on the veil and looking at the veil here. Um, this is, most people say, winter, shepherd, McGarvey, most people say it refers to two coverings. Kaufman and Zurr say that it's a hair only. But the lexicons, as I said already, say that that's not really the case. Paul says women in public worship, and I think he's talking about public worship here, ought to be covered, but men ought not to be. And I think he's talking about women in the presence of men in this situation. The passage because of the angels in verse 10 is one that gives a lot of people trouble. Um, he says, the English Standard Version says, a wife, a woman or a wife, ought to have 
a symbol of authority on our head because of the angels. What did the angels have to do with it? And what angels is he talking about? Well, both questions need to be addressed. I don't know how well to answer both questions, but both of them should be addressed. Apparently, angels have some part and are present in worship services. That ought not to surprise anyone, because I guess angels, as they are uh, to us, are, are spirits, and so is God, and so is, so is Christ. God is spirit, Jesus said, uh, as well as the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, I am in the midst of you. That's already been talked about this morning as applying to a situation of church uh, discipline, but I think it's a general statement that applies to other things as well, and I think it means when we come together to worship. That would explain, of course, why Jesus said that he would not eat of this bread or drink of this cup until he did it again in his Father's kingdom, and that's in the church. In other words, Jesus is present with us at the Lord's Supper. I think that's plainly what it said. Well, evidently angels have something to do with being present in our worship services. Angels. Good angels? Probably. Uh, nearly everybody says that. Oh, of course, the word angelos can mean a messenger, and some people point that out. And a few people, not many, a few say that's probably what's referred to here. Some bishop or some authority in the church. <coughs> we don't have authorities in the church of that kind that they're talking about. But, but they say maybe that's the situation. Most people think, no, that is not, that's not really what we're talking about here. <coughs> what we're talking about is angels. And Plummer says that when he doesn't describe them any more than just, say, angels, he has to mean good angels. Because if they were evil angels, he would be saying something different about them. Most people agree with that. What does that mean? Because good angels are there, whether in the worship service or somewhere, women should dress properly, have her hair uh, long or long enough as a covering and have some kind of veil or covering on. Maybe because the angels, somebody suggested that, as Isaiah says, that, that angels had a veil too. I don't know about that. But angels obey God. And this is a matter of women obeying God. And so they ought to do that so as to not shame the angels or shock the angels or whatever. And some other people say, and again, Kaufman is one of those, McGuigan is another one, no, it means evil angels. <clears throat> and some people, not Kaufman or McGuigan, some people say, well, because evil angels would lust after them if they didn't have their veil on. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Because, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, angels don't have sexual attitudes. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven. And whether evil angels are good angels, uh, I think they haven't changed their nature, the evil angels, by becoming evil. Uh, their nature is not of a sexual kind of thing. So when he's talking about the angels here, uh, I think he's talking about good angels. And I confess with Winters and Barnes that I don't fully understand everything about it. But I will not say with Holiday that that means that this passage is hopelessly unclear. Uh, all he's saying here is that because the angels have something to do with this, women should obey this rule. Now, the rule is not just a rule at Corinth. He says, as in all the churches, in verse 16. And somebody said, well, what Paul's saying is, <coughs> this is what he wanted them to do. But if they don't want to do that, it doesn't really matter. No, he's not going to, in one verse, verse 16, nullify everything he said in verses 2 through 15. That doesn't make any sense. Now, what he's saying is that the churches had no such custom as that of rejecting the customs or the, the meaning of the customs or the, or the 
style of dress because they, by custom, implied a certain kind of lifestyle. He's, he, is, he is saying that they had no such custom as rejecting styles that involve principles or that signify standards. <coughs> Some object to men being bareheaded in worship because modern Jews wear their beanies. Uh, that's not, that's really not relevant, I don't think. Uh, because modern Jews wear beanies doesn't mean that Jews in ancient times wore beanies. And besides that, Paul's not talking to Jews as such. He's talking to the church at Corinth. And this involves their custom, their custom. Now, if we had a custom that said that women have to wear some kind of hat, or they are considered immoral, or they are considered not in subject to men or to their husbands, then I would say, yes, if that's the case, then we ought to do that. The issue in part is one of authority. The rule was not just at Corinth. Uh, the rule was a universal rule, and it applies to authority and values. Paul does not argue here or anywhere else that women are inferior to men. Most women that I know, guys don't get angry at me, but most women that I know are actually better than men. They are morally better. They're spiritually better. Just yesterday, I went with the preacher up at Catanning to visit a man who hadn't come to the services. Guess what? His wife had. She came all the time, not him. It's been my experience that a great many more women than men do that, come without their spouses uh, this is just the way this is just, just the way it is and until women's lib became so heavily popular in our country uh, women did not engage in the things that men did back in the old days most men smoked most women didn't men often drank became drunk crowds around most women didn't Things have changed some because of women's lib. Even so, it still appears to me as I look at congregations and as I preach to brethren and so forth and work with them that more women than men are interested in the gospel of Christ, are more spiritually minded than men. So in some ways, women are superior to men. They live longer too, you know, they do. But... In public worship assemblies, women, and in the church in general, women do not have leadership roles. There are women elders in some churches. I have a cousin, well, she's dead now, I had a cousin, who was an elder in the Presbyterian church. We talked about that a little bit. How can you be the husband of one wife? <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, they had long since left the scriptures behind. But the fact of the matter is, elders are men. Preachers are men. Now Paul is not going to say this here, but when he gets on over into 1 Corinthians 14, he is going to be very specific and say, let your women keep silence in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as also says the law. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. It's shameful for women to speak in the church. The woman who told me that she could preach better than men said that, as a matter of fact, uh, this was just a custom of the times that showed simply that Paul was a crusty old bachelor and a woman hater. I don't think so. I don't think so. Paul said, 
to the to First Timothy, in First Timothy, chapter two, verse twelve, well, verses eleven and twelve, uh, he says, "Let a woman keep or learn in silence with all submission." And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Why? Because I'm a crusty old bachelor? No, no. He says, because Adam was formed first and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. He gives two reasons there that have nothing whatsoever to do with his attitude toward women. It's a matter of priority and creation. Who determined that? That was God. Why did he do it that way? I don't know. I have no idea. Perhaps if you behave yourself well and serve the Lord well, one day you'll be able to ask him. And maybe he'll tell you. And maybe he won't. I don't know. But, but he bases it on the priority of Adam. In chapter 11, he bases it on the law. That's what the law says. Well, on the priority of Adam having been created first and on Eve sinning first. This is God's rule. This is not my rule. This is God's rule. Now, the application has to do with authority today. Feminists reject that. But women's hair and head coverings are not symbols of authority in our culture. However, I think men's head coverings and hair length are still, by most of our society, involved in this way. Uh, people see men with long hair and men who wear a hat or a cap in worship as not being what they should be. Women simply do not have leadership roles in public worship. This is a statement of an inspired man. Paul said he thought that he had the spirit of Christ in that very chapter where, where that said. And he, he meant by that that he was inspired. No question about it. Two issues here, authority and well, doesn't seem to work. Authority, there we go. Authority and appearance. And in their culture, authority was demonstrated or meant by a certain appearance. Authority is used by some young people to symbolize rebellion and independence, but people still make judgment based on appearance, based on hairstyle and dress. And if in our culture it was required that women wear something, then they should wear whatever is required. We don't even know what the veil was like that they wore. Veils represented different things at different times. Tamar's veil, or covering, or shawl, or whatever, branded her as a prostitute. Ruth's shawl, or covering, or whatever it was, was big enough for her to carry six measures of barley in it. We simply don't know. But it doesn't matter about that. The lesson for us simply is this. Men and women should wear clothing and hairstyle that will lead people to think highly of Christ and his church. That's what it means to us. Thank you.